Hebrew or Aramaic, what language did Jesus and his disciples speak? Does it really matter? Well, when it comes to salvation, it really doesn't matter what he spoke. You can believe anything you want about the language that he spoke. It's not going to change your status in the kingdom. But it does matter when it comes to understanding the Jewish culture, understanding of the words that Jesus spoke, and having that historical and biblical accuracy, and the trustworthiness of the Bible. You see, there's a lot that's riding on this. When we begin to say, well, it doesn't really mean what it says. The Bible says this, but it means something else. What are we doing? We're sowing seeds of doubt in there. We are saying that you cannot trust it. And we begin to obfuscate what the Lord Jesus, or who he really was. Jesus was Jewish. He came for the elect of Israel. That's who he came for. And so he needs to connect linguistically, culturally, in every way, genetically as well, with the Jewish people. So understanding what language Jesus spoke actually has a lot of importance. If you want, if you were to think he spoke Greek, that's fine. I don't think you're, you're going to get kicked out of heaven, but you'll just be wrong. So we see that everything in Scripture matters, but not everything has the same weight. And this is one of those issues today, that we're looking at what language he spoke. Again, this isn't going to kick you out of the kingdom, but it does matter because God said it. And that's why we're going to study it. So look at, consider, for example, the, the cross versus the name of Jeremiah's scribe. The cross, the whole doctrine and understanding of the cross has vast importance. It's very heavy. But as far as the name of Jeremiah's scribe, whether you know that or not, is somewhat immaterial. His name was Baruch, by the way. But it doesn't change uh, much of our bottom line. So we also have testing God's word via verifiable details. We see that Scripture is true in everything that it says at every level of importance. God was careful to record details accurately regarding the language of Jesus. And God's Word boldly declares itself authoritative and accurate in every detail. We see in Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your Word is truth. Psalm 138, verse 2, you have magnified your Word above all your name. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the word of our God stands forever. Every word of God is pure, Proverbs 30, verse 5. And sanctify them by your word, your word is truth, John 17, 17. So there are many places, and these are not all, but many places where God's word declares itself to be true. So again, understanding what language Jesus spoke. And here's where we're going with this. Many people believe that, G that when it says Hebrew, that Jesus spoke Hebrew or Paul spoke Hebrew, they say that doesn't really mean that. It really means Aramaic. And that is where those seeds of, of doubt begin to enter in to our minds and say, does it really say that? Can I trust it? If I can't trust it over here, can I trust it over here on something that is even weightier? If we get the name of Baruch, uh, Jeremiah's scribe wrong and say, well, it, his name wasn't really Baruch, it was something else. It was Moshe. Then can we trust what else? the Bible says, because we believe it to be completely inerrant and infallible. So everything in His Word has to be true. And we find that there are some unfortunate examples. There's a lot of assumptions that have entered in. Take, for example, a man Davis Young, uh, who named... speaks about Augustine. And he says, it would appear that Augustine, the great theologian, a man saturated in Holy Scripture, actually encourages the church not to cling dogmatically to specific renderings of the text, but to rethink its interpretation in the light of genuine extra-biblical knowledge. Perhaps we should pay him serious attention. Augustine is obviously interested in the science of his own day and interacts with it. He takes extra-biblical knowledge seriously. And then he goes on to say, it is clear that Augustine accepts spontaneous generation of organisms and the four elements of Greek thought. Now, this is not related specifically to the language of Jesus. But it brings up an important point, is that here you have someone who believes in evolution, and he says, well, we can go back to Augustine, and Augustine says that it's okay not to stick with the true text. And he also says it's clear that Augustine accepts spontaneous generation. Now, the problem with that is, he then goes on, he says, and the four elements of Greek thought. Well, the four elements of Greek thought, you have fire, wind, water, and earth. These are the four elements. And we know that these, there are far more than just four elements. And those are not even elements. 
And so he was wrong on that. He must have been wrong on spontaneous generation. And yet here, Davis Young is encouraging us to not stick with the literal interpretation of Scripture. So it really does matter that we stick with the Bible, we stick with what it says, because otherwise we'll fall into some very unfortunate assumptions about the Bible. And there are a number of false scholarly assumptions about God's Word. First of all, it's not to be taken literally. And they also presume that it speaks in big generalities, that it, it has a certain flair of truth. It's big in, uh, you know, sort of that, that truth with a little t, or kind of like Aesop's fables. There definitely is some truth in Aesop's fables. You have the hare and the tortoise. There's a truth in that, right? We understand that you need to uh, persevere and keep at it. But none of us would actually believe that a a uh, tortoise and a hare had a little conversation with each other one day and then they started off on this race. We, but we do see a kind of truth in that. But the Bible does not fall in that category of truth. It's absolute truth. It's true in all that it says. It's literally true. And we do not believe that it just speaks in big generalities. They also believe that the details are merely ornamentation but not absolute literal truths. And so what happens is they begin to believe that man's science is more accurate than the Bible in other words, they would say, reinterpret the Bible to fit our knowledge of the world and not vice versa. But what I'm advocating is that we start with the biblical text and then we work our way outward. If the Bible says that Paul spoke to the children of Israel or the Jews there in the temple in Hebrew, then that's what it means. If it says that Jesus spoke to Paul in Hebrew, then that's what it means. And to say anything else is to sow de doubt in our text. And so we find the underlying assumption is that man knows better, but it's not true. The Word of God stands forever. And so therefore, they come to the assumption that any time the New Testament says Hebrew, it really means Aramaic, and we know better, in other words, we know better than what Scripture plainly says. So I reject these assumptions because they're not true. In the homeland of the Jewish people in the first century AD, Aramaic was a mother tongue and principal language of most of the people, including virtually all of the women. This is according to Barbara Grimes in her book, Language Choice in First Century Christianity. Now, she's making an assumption here. She's making an assumption that Hebrew had died out and that Aramaic had replaced it. And this is the overwhelming position of scholars today. So I am definitely the odd man out, but I'm okay with that. And this whole quest to discover what was really the language of Jesus started several years ago. I was attending a class where uh, a student asked a certain teacher the question, what language did Jesus speak? And he quickly replied, Aramaic, of course. And I went up to him later and I said, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that Jesus spoke Hebrew. And he said to me, oh, did they brainwash you when you were over there in Israel? at the Hebrew University. And I thought, no, I don't think I was the one that was brainwashed. Uh, over there, it's, it's more or less common knowledge that Jesus spoke Hebrew, and yet, and that's also what the Bible says. So we're going to see that the majority, the vast majority of scholars would say that Aramaic replaced Hebrew, but we're going to find that the Bible and other ancient sources say just the opposite. Uh, according to Alfred Edersheim, he suggests that Hebrew was nothing more than a language used in the temple and synagogues, and the messages had to be translated into Aramaic for the commoners. Uh, Abraham Geiger's suggestion, given in 1845, that Mishnaic Hebrew was an artificial creation of rabbis whose native tongue was Aramaic. And lastly, Matthew Black, he says, the Aramaic-speaking masses could no longer understand Hebrew. The use of the term Hebrew to refer to Aramaic is readily explicable, since it described the peculiar dialect of Aramaic, which had grown up in Palestine since the days of Nehemiah, and which was distinctively Jewish. So this is just a quick sampling of the scholars that are out there, and they, they believe that Aramaic had replaced Hebrew. But again, we're calling into question, we're doubting what the scriptures say. We'll even see in the differences in the the English translations that there now is some, some question here. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porches. That's John 5, 2 according to the New King James. That's also reiterated in the Amplified Bible. They stick with Hebrew. But if we go over and look at the ESV, it says in Aramaic called Bethesda. Uh, 
looking at John 19, 13. And sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabata. And sat down in the judgment sat seat at a place called the pavement, the mosaic pavement, the stone platform in Hebrew, Gabata. So again, the New King James and the Amplified are in agreement, whereas in this case, the Net Bible says Gabata in Aramaic. And then lastly, John 19, 17, they went to the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golugota, and then in the Net Bible, called in Aramaic, Golugota. But we have to find out which of these is correct. They cannot both be true. One of them has to be true, and the other is false. For example, in Acts 26, 14, where Paul is giving his account to King Agrippa of his experience on the road to Damascus when the Lord Jesus came and met him, and he says, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language. But if you read the NIV, it says, I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. So which is it? Did Jesus say it once in Hebrew for the New King James uh, and other translations, and then another time in Aramaic for the other translations? Or did he say it only once? Of course, we know that to be true. He said it only once, and he said it in the language that he said it, which we're going to see is clearly Hebrew. Well. First of all, what languages could Jesus have spoken anyway? He was probably trilingual, and I believe that he would have spoken Aramaic. I don't think that, I'm not against that idea, but what we're going to find is that his principal language, his mother tongue, was Hebrew. It's not to say that he didn't know Aramaic. He probably knew Greek as well, but he spoke Hebrew on a daily basis. So Aramaic, well, where did Aramaic come from anyway? This little country called Aram was taken captive by the big bad Assyrians in the 8th century. The Arameans spoke Aramaic, of course, and their language was using an alphabet that consisted of only 22 letters. Whereas the Assyrians used something called cuneiform to do their writing. And they had over tw uh, 600 symbols in this, what's called a syllabary. So you had to learn at least 600 different symbols to be able to write something. That is far more complex and difficult than learning only 22 letters. So what happened is because the Arameans were, were such traitors, they were businessmen, they, they were taken and displaced by the Assyrians, which was their policy to displace people groups. And the, the Arameans continued to do their, their trading and eventually their language became the lingua franca in place of Akkadian, though they are similar. And also the, la the writing system overtook the cuneiform writing system because Aramaic is much easier to write with only 22 letters versus the 600 and some. And later we find that the Persian Empire would come and conquer the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians conquered the, Akkad the Assyrians or the Akkadians and then eventually the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And the Persian Empire was enormous. But they continued to use Aramaic as their language of choice, their court language. Even though different people groups in their kingdom would have spoken various languages, what was unifying them was their use of Aramaic. Very similar to how you can go anywhere in the world and people speak their language, but they might also speak, they probably also speak English. English is uniting the world. That could change someday, but for the moment, it's English. It used to be French, but today we get to enjoy English. Well, he spoke Aramaic. He probably also spoke Greek. There's good, good reason to think that he also spoke Greek. We know that Alexander the Great uh, would eventually come, but looking at the Greek period, we have the Mycenaean period from about 1500 to around 900 BC. This ends with Homer. We then enter the Classical period from around 900 B.C. to about 300 B.C., and this would end with Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, what he did is he went and conquered the Persian Empire, and he replaced, for the most part, he, or I should say he added to the use of Aramaic, he also added Greek. He did more than conquer it militarily, he also conquered it culturally. Uh, he instituted a lot of schools and gymnasiums, as it were, were put into these various cities, and so the Greek culture began to spread very quickly. And as a result of that, you now have another layer, another linguistic layer that is added on top of Aramaic.
So when we come back to the land of Israel, what we find is that by the first century that people would have known Aramaic, they also would have known Greek, but they never lost their ability to speak Hebrew. And that brings us up to the question of Hebrew. Well, let's take a, just a quick progression, a really fast history of the Hebrew, lang uh, Hebrew language. You have Proto-Hebrew, starting with roughly 2000 with Abraham. Then we have what's known as Standard Biblical Hebrew. We have guys like Moses, David, Isaiah. They were writing in a type of Hebrew that is more or less consistent. They would have been able to speak to one another because their Hebrew is still pretty close. There are some variances for sure, but it's, it's roughly uh, the same. And then we come to a major point, which in 586 is when the children of Israel, the Judeans, were taken captive into Babylon. And that becomes a very... Uh, very clear focal point. And then we have what's called late biblical Hebrew. When the, the captives come back from their captivity in Babylon after 70 years, they come back and they're speaking what's known as late biblical Hebrew. How do we know that? Well, we have the likes of Zechariah, Malachi, Haggai, Esther, and Nehemiah. And these latter prophets, including Nehemiah and Esther, which are not prophets, of course, but the prophets were speaking to their people and they were giving the message that was coming from God. If the message was so important, and it was, why would they speak in Hebrew if nobody was speaking Hebrew? You see, they gave their messages in Hebrew. And that suggests very, very strongly that the people that were listening were speaking Hebrew. If, in fact, as the, the suggestion goes, as the theory goes, if the children of Israel had lost their ability to speak Hebrew after the captivity, then why were the prophets speaking to them in Hebrew? That doesn't make any sense. They should have spoken Aramaic if that's the case. But that really proves the point. They didn't lose their ability to speak Hebrew. We then have what is called intertestamental Hebrew. This is from around the 4th century to about the 2nd century BC, roughly. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have the Book of Ben Sirah, also Jubilees. These were written in Hebrew, primarily. And then we have Mishnaic Hebrew from the 2nd century B.C. till about 135 A.D. This is the writing of the, the Mishnah, uh, the Bar Kokhva letters, etc., things that we will look at. So we're going to look at the following evidence. We have biblical evidence from the, the Tanakh, or the, the Old Testament, as it were. We have intertestamental evidence. We have historical evidence, that is, extra-biblical evidence. We have the New Testament, and then we have, lastly, the linguistic evidence. So let's look at each one of those. At the biblical evidence, we have the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. And we have this account. It says, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. The word in Hebrew for distinctly is the word meforash. This is often argued that this word means translated, but it really doesn't mean that. It just means to do something clearly, distinctly. Uh, and we find in other places, looking at that same root, for example, in Leviticus 24, verse 12, then they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. We're looking there at that same root, and we see it has nothing to do with translation, but it has to do with making something clear. In Numbers 15.34, they put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Again, that same Hebrew root is to make something clear. It has nothing to do with translating from one language to another. We have correspondence from Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, in Ezra 4.7. Now, what's interesting about Ezra is that half the book is written in Hebrew and the other half is written in Aramaic. And it says, And the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. There we have the word meturgam. That shows us that this is not simply making something clear, but it's an actual translation. The, writ the, the letter was first written in Hebrew in the land of Israel, and then it's translated for the sake of the king, for those in Persia, it's translated into Aramaic, using Aramaic letters for the king. And then the king gets it, he 
it's read, he, and then he sends a response. He says, the letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me. So then we, have, we go back to that, that root there that we saw before to make something distinct. So he says, the letter was read to me very clearly. He doesn't say the letter was read translating it to me, but it was read clearly to me. So the argument, the supposed argument that we have in Nehemiah 8.8 8 falls apart. It does not prove that the children of Israel lost their ability to speak Hebrew. And that's what people would say is that they read translating from the law, the book of the law, so that they could understand it. But it's not that they lost their ability to, to understand it. It's just kind of like what we do in, in our services today, where the, the pastor will get up and he will give an explanation uh, of the text. He will, ex, ex, um, he will expand upon it, uh, giving you the, the meaning of it. What does it actually mean? And that's what they were doing back then. We, of course, have the latter prophets that we talked about already. Zechariah, Malachi, Haggai. These three prophets were giving a message to the people that God wanted them to hear, and they were doing it in a language that the people understood. And these books are written in Hebrew not Aramaic. They're written in Hebrew. Now, it's what's called late biblical Hebrew, so it is slightly different, just like there would be differences between the English of today and the English of 50 years ago or 70 years ago. There are going to be differences, clearly, but still it's the same language, and we could, any one of us could speak to someone from 100 years ago, even though things have changed. We have the intertestamental evidence. Looking at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, that was from about 280 to about 250 B.C. It says, Then Eliakim said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew. The word there in Aramaic is the word suristi. So again, this is written originally, this, the Septuagint is written in Greek, and the word that we have there is the word suristi. That tells us that they are using a distinct, Hebrew, or a distinct Greek word to talk about Aramaic. And not, don't speak to us in Hebrew, or that is Udaiti, or Judean. We will come back to that, so hold on to that thought for just a second. Then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are found in the area of Qumran, Israel. More than 800 documents and fragments are mostly in Hebrew. So we would expect to see Aramaic if the vast majority of people are only speaking Hebrew or Aramaic and they lost their ability to speak Hebrew then we would be very surprised to find so many documents in Hebrew. And what's so amazing about it is that these documents are commentaries and they're using up-to-date language to talk about the things that they're seeing in, in various texts and such. So it's not, a, it's not a stiff religious language, but it's a living language that they were writing and thinking in. We have Mishnaic Hebrew. These are the, the rabbinic writings up through the second century A.D. And this was the, the Hebrew that was being used at the time of Jesus. So yeah, there is a different kind of Hebrew that's being used, but it's still Hebrew, and it's not a different language like Aramaic. And then we have the Targumim. These are the Aramaic translations of, of the Tanakh, of the Old Testament. And there's a few misunderstandings about them. First of all, we discover that many were written after Jesus' day. And secondly, many were written outside of Israel. What that tells us is that those that were written after Jesus' day have no influence on, or no bearing, I should say, on what people were speaking in the land of Israel in Jesus' day. And also, people were using these Aramaic translations for those people that were outside of the land. Certainly after so many years, they are going, people that are living outside the land are going to begin to lose their ability to speak Hebrew. And so they did need some kind of a companion to help them understand that better. And so that's what these, these Targumim served as. But so insofar as what people were speaking, what the Jews were speaking in the land of Israel, in the days of Jesus, these give us no supporting um, arguments for Aramaic being the first language there. And then the historical evidence. We see the historical evidence uh, looking first of all at Josephus. Now he, in his book Antiquities of the Jews, he gives us a, 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 a very similar interpretation to what we saw already in 
2 Kings 18.26, we looked at that in the Septuagint. But here we have it in Josephus' words. And notice he says, when Rabshakeh had made this speech in the Hebrew language, for he was skillful in that language, so he desired him to speak in the Syrian tongue. We have two different words that are being used. We have one is Ebraisti, which is, of course, Hebrew. And the other one, Syrian, which also means Aramaic, and it's the word Suristi. If, as people suggest, Hebrew really means Aramaic, then why didn't the writers in the New Testament simply use the word Suristi? We know that there were two different words to describe these languages. There's a distinct word for Hebrew. There's a distinct word for Aramaic. Josephus was clever enough to use both of those words. Certainly, the New Testament writers could have used either of those words if they wanted to, or they could have used Suristi in order to describe Aramaic, but they didn't. They used the word Ebraisti in uh, all cases. And then, in the Wars of the Jews, Josephus says, but then Titus sent Josephus to speak to them, that is, the Jews, in their own language, for he imagined that they might yield to the persuasion of a countryman of their own. Well, what is their own language, according to Josephus? He says later in Wars of the Jews, he says, Upon this Josephus stood in such a place where he might be heard, and then declared to them what Caesar had given him in charge, and this in the Hebrew language. So their own language is Hebrew. And we know that Josephus had in his vocabulary the word for Aramaic. If he'd wanted to say their own language was Aramaic, he could have said, and he spoke to them in the Aramaic language, Suristi. But he doesn't do that. He says that he spoke to them in their own language, in the Hebrew language. So, very powerful statement from Josephus telling us that they were speaking Hebrew versus Aramaic. And then later we come to the Bar Kokhba letters. Bar Kokhba was the leader of the Second Jewish Revolt. This took place between 132 and 135 AD. They got the bright idea to rebel against Rome. Essentially, uh, um, the Caesar, Hadrian, decided that they should no longer be able to practice circumcision nor to keep other Jewish rituals. And so the people rebelled against him, and Bar Kokhba was their leader. And he wrote a series of letters to his soldiers. And we find that many letters were written in Hebrew with colloquialisms. In other words, using the everyday, you might also almost call it slang, but this, the, the very modern, up-to-date language of his day is what he was using in his letters. So again, we see that this is a living language and it's not a dead language. We have the historical evidence from the fragments of Papias. Papias was a disciple of John, and he wrote, or he lived between 70 and 155 AD. And he states that Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language. We find Jerome writing in the fourth century. Jerome lived in Bethlehem for some time. He learned Hebrew. And he states that Matthew was compo composed the gospel of Christ at first published in Judea in Hebrew for the sake of those of the circumcision who believed. But this was afterwards translated into Greek. So both of these men are telling us that Matthew wrote his gospel originally in Hebrew and then it was later translated into Greek. My take on it is that Matthew would have been the translator of his own book. And if that's the case, and it's a, a speculation that I cannot prove, but if I'm right, that would solve the thorny issue of how can the Greek manuscript that we have still be inspired. Well, if Matthew is serving as his own translator, then the Holy Spirit is still guiding him in the writing and or translation of that text. So I believe that the Greek book of Matthew that we have is fully inspired, but it was originally written in Hebrew. And lastly, we come to the New Testament evidence. We see in the New Testament evidence verses such as Acts 21.40. Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. He spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Again, in the Greek, what we find there is the word Ebraidi, and it's not the word Suristi. Why don't we find the word Suristi if Hebrew really means Aramaic? Or if they had lost their ability to speak Hebrew, why don't they use the word Aramaic? It existed in their vocabulary, but here Luke decides not to use that. He uses the word Hebraidi because that's what they were speaking. They were speaking Hebrew.
Paul speaking to King Agrippa. He says, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language. Once again, he is hearing the voice of Jesus speak to him, and it's in the Hebrew language, and it's not in the Aramaic language. And then we find that the sign on Jesus' cross was in Hebrew and not Aramaic. So there's a tremendous amount of evidence. We also find that the names, most names in the New Testament are in Hebrew. For example, we have John, which is Yohanan in Hebrew. We have Simon, which is Shimon. These are good Hebrew names. Now, Kepha is very interesting. Kepha is an actual Aramaic word, meaning rock or stone. But there's also a Hebrew root of that same word, the word kef. So, again, it's hard to say which language it came from, uh, since we do find that same root in Hebrew. Thomas is Theom, uh, Jacob or James is Yaakov, Matthew is Matai, Judas is Yehuda. These are good Hebrew names. So we see that even the linguistic context, the, the context of, of where these people were living was in uh, a Hebrew setting. But, of course, there are some variances. For example, Simon has really three names. He's Shimon, he's also Kepha, and he later becomes Petros. So here's a guy with three different names. Uh, of course, Kepha and Petros mean the same thing, just one is in Hebrew or Aramaic, and the other is in Greek. So we can learn just some, some basic things about what the, the cultural context was by looking at their names. And then lastly, the linguistic evidence. We're going to look at the words of Jesus and the Gospels. An important term for us to understand before going forward is the word transliteration. Here's the word hallelujah in Hebrew, here it is in Greek, and here it is in English. They all mean praise the Lord, but praise the Lord is the translation. But from going from Hebrew to Aramaic to English, those are all they all sound the same, but they're rendered differently in different languages. That's called transliteration. That's an important term so that we can uh, look at some other terms here. And we have some words that are transliterated. They're, they're Hebrew words that are transliterated into Greek. We have the word Sabbatha, we have Pascha, and then we have Golugota. Well, looking first at Sabbatha and Pascha, we find that these two words appear in the Septuagint. So the word uh, sabbata is the Hebrew word Shabbat. And in the Greek Septuagint, what we find is this word is always transliterated as sabbata. Now, the argument goes like this. That little letter that is highlighted there, the, the alpha, uh, alpha that what they're suggesting, the, uh, the naysayers, <laughs> those that believe in uh, Aramaic was uh, the language, the primary language, would say, that that is indicative of the article, the word the, in Aramaic. And yet, what we find is that it is always transliterated as sabata in the Greek Septuagint. And so that tells us that it cannot be talking about, it cannot be the article, but it has to just be a transliteration of that word. Here's another word, Pesach. Pesach is a good Hebrew word. It's Hebrew of Hebrew, just like Shabbat is Hebrew of Hebrew, and, and when this is always transliterated into, into Greek, it's translated as Pascha. And essentially, the, the Greeks needed some kind of a little helping vowel at the end in order for them to pronounce that better. So our conclusion by looking at these is that the little alpha is not a transliteration or an indication of the Aramaic article the, but it is actually a transliteration, and it has nothing to do with the word the. Then we come to the words uh, in John 19, 17. And carrying his cross, he went out to a place being called place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Now that same suggestion is held here as well, that the little a ah at the end of Golgotha is indicative of the word the. But what we're going to find is that the Hebrew word for skull is Golgolet. And if we look closely at the Greek text, it doesn't say a place of the skull. It actually says a place of a skull. And we can see that in the Greek. It's kranio topon. And so the, the article, the word the, is conspicuously missing. If, this, if the little a at the end of Golgotha indicated the word the, 
then we ought to see that in the Greek text. But in fact, we don't when it is uh, translated there in Greek, giving us an explanation of what it means. We also come to the words that Jesus said on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, 46, it says, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama svaktani, which is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in Mark 15, 34, and at the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama svaktani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. So we have to try to reconcile these two passages. If you've ever given this some thought, you're like, well, which is it? We're going to look at that right now. First of all, we go back to the original in Matthew, or excuse me, in Psalm 22. The original in Hebrew goes like this, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani. So already the word azavtani is not in our text, but we have the word shvaktani. That's our first issue, which we'll look at. Then looking at the Aramaic translation of Psalm 22, it goes like this, Eli Elahi metulma shabaktani. So we have quite a few variances from what we have in the Gospels and also from the, the Hebrew text. Then looking at Matthew 27, Eli Eli lama sfaktani, Greek and uh, the Mark uh, passage there, Eloi Eloi lama sfaktani, in Syriac, which is the Aramaic translation of the New Testament, it is written as such, Elahi, Elahi, Lamna, Shvaktani. And then in Matthew 27, Eli, Eli, Lamna, Shvaktani. So all of these have a lot of differences and variations. How do we reconcile all of these? Well, first of all, we look at the word Elohim in the Hebrew, the word God. And we find that in Hebrew, it can be rendered three different ways. Elohim, Eloah, and El. Elohim is plural, Eloah is singular, and the word El is also singular. In Aramaic, the ways that you can say God are Elah and El. And both uh, true to both Hebrew and Aramaic, to say my God, you can say Eli. But in only Hebrew, can you say Elohai? In, o in Aramaic only can you say Elahi, and, but we do find a very interesting passage in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 11. We have a form which is Eloho. And so based on this, this is from the word Eloah, and if you put the, the possessive marker to say my, your, his, you put that at the end of the word, it would be, tr it would be tr changed into Eloho. And so by the rules of grammar, we can see that my God would become Elohi, Elohi. So grammatically, Elohi exists, though we don't find it specifically attested in Scripture. We do, we do know that just by the rules of grammar, Elohi is a real possibility. And so when that becomes transliterated into Greek, it is transliterated as Elohi. Now, what happened here? In Greek, there's no way to put the letter H, the English letter H, or the, that rough breathing, in the middle of a word. You can put it at the beginning of a word, but you cannot put it at the, be, at the middle or even at the end. You can only put that at the beginning. So when you try to say Elohi in Greek, the best you could do is to say Eloi, Eloi. And that explains why the Markan, translate, the Markan version of that is the more likely. Because here it's taking what Jesus said, Elohi, and the He falls out. The easier way to say that, to transliterate that into Greek, would be the word Eli. It's very simple to transliterate that. But the, the Elohi is the more difficult. And so based on that, I would argue that Jesus actually said Elohi. He said the Markan version, Elohi, Elohi, Lama, Shvaktani, there on the cross, versus Eli, Eli, which Matthew has. And I would say that Matthew simply used Eli, Eli, because it resonated from Psalm 22, and it was a lot easier to write in, in Greek. So that would, that would take care of that difficulty. So again, there's no rough breathing in the middle of a word in, in Greek, and so that hey would there fall out. We have the word lama. This is a good Hebrew word. It appears 145 times in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. 
And then the word shvaktani. Well, this is an interesting word. This is found in the Mishnah in a Hebrew context. So again, the Mishnah is Hebrew, but this is actually a loan word from Aramaic. But we find this word seven times in the Mishnah. So what that tells us is that this is a loan word, and it then becomes part of the Hebrew uh, vocabulary. Very much like we have a lot of uh, German or French words in English. We say coup d'etat, and none of us is thinking, oh, do you speak French? We just have these words that we use. We have other words, like the word sac. That's a, a word that actually we probably got from French, and where did the French get it? They go all the way back to, the, to Hebrew. That came from Hebrew. And yet, when I say, please give me a sack, I'm not thinking Hebrew. I'm just thinking, I need some kind of a back. That's all I'm thinking. So there's a lot of examples like that, where you have a loan word that will be borrowed by a culture. And then they say, this is a great word. Let's continue to use it. And that's what was happening here. Now, why Jesus would say shvaktani instead of azavtani, I'm not entirely sure. My argument would be that he was using a word that was very popular in his day. People understood it. It had some, and for some reason, had replaced the word azavtani. I don't know exactly why, but he was saying it in the vernacular, if you will. Uh, and of course, it, it echoed very strongly Psalm 22. So our conclusions, we see from the Old Testament evidence that Nehemiah and Ezra were speaking in Hebrew. From the intertestamental evidence, we conclude that the language was Hebrew. From the historical and extra-biblical sources, we can conclude that it was Hebrew. And then from the New Testament, we also conclude it's Hebrew. And lastly, from the linguistic evidence we, and Jesus' own words, we see that the language they were using was Hebrew. And so, our big conclusion is that Jesus spoke Hebrew as his primary language. And that means that when he was speaking with the disciples, he was speaking Hebrew. When he was speaking with the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and the scribes, he was speaking Hebrew. Was he, when he was giving his teachings to the children of Israel, he was speaking in Hebrew. In the marketplace, it was Hebrew. Now, did he know Aramaic? I believe he did. We have no positive evidence that he did, but just because of the, the, the cultural and linguistic context, he probably knew Hebrew or Aramaic as well. In fact, when you go to Israel today, you will find, if you happen to go downtown, or, or in the, the old city, I should say, you'll find that so many of the vendors will speak very good English with you. And then when somebody from Spain comes along, they speak pretty good Spanish to them as well. And they know some Japanese, and they know a, a whole lot of languages, because they want to do business. But you'll also find that there exists really four different languages in Israel today. Of course, Hebrew is their language. That's the language that, that is the uh, official language. It unifies everybody. But a lot of Israelis will speak very good English. Uh, a lot of Israelis will also speak, they'll speak Arabic. And then because of the influx of Russian Jews, many speak Russian. So it's a land of four languages and even more. And that was the case back in the first century, is it wasn't just one language, like we often think here in the United States, that people were speaking only one language, but people spoke a number of languages, and it was very, very common. So he probably also spoke Aramaic, he probably also spoke Greek, but we have firm evidence that he spoke Hebrew with the, with the, with the Jews. Perhaps when he spoke with those uh, Greeks that came along and wanted to speak to him, maybe he spoke Greek to them. When he went to to Sidon, maybe he spoke Aramaic. When he was with the woman at the well there in Samaria, perhaps he was speaking Aramaic. It's very, very possible. But did he speak Hebrew? He sure did. That was his mother tongue. That was the language that he communicated in. And it's very important because if we disconnect Jesus linguistically from the Bible, from the Old Testament, then we've now disconnected him from the Jewish people. We've made Jews, Jesus just a little further away from being a Jew and more into being a Gentile or Greek Christian. We don't want to do that. He came for the lost children of Israel. He came to, uh, to bring them back first and foremost, and then the rest of us get to be grafted in. It's a pretty good deal. But he spoke Hebrew, and we can stand on what the, the Bible says, that it says uh, what it meant to say. We don't have to reinterpret it, and we can trust it in everything that it says.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can trust your word. Thank you for just the depth that you have um, you've given there, Lord, and even the details of what language did Jesus speak. There's so much good evidence showing us that it was Hebrew. Thank you for that, Lord. And thank you that we can trust you in everything that you say. We don't have to doubt what you say, but just simply believe it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Targumim would have become popular after 135 A.D. After 135, when you have the Second Jewish Revolt, that is when we can say that Hebrew really did begin to die out. It began to, to waste away because uh, Hadrian came and they, they really stomped on the Jews. They salted the land. They told people to get out and don't come back. Uh, if we see you here in Jerusalem, you'll be killed. And that's when Hebrew began to die as a spoken language. And uh, so then Aramaic would have, uh, would have filled that gap to some extent. Of course, Greek would have as well. Uh, as the centuries wear on, Aramaic is going to fall out also. But uh, Hebrew really began to die at that point, and uh, it was replaced by Greek. The difference between Hebrew and Aramaic is more or less like Spanish and Italian. If you know one, you can pretty much fake your way in the other. Uh, and if you're, if you're really fluent, you can, you can do okay. You can get around the city, you can ask some questions. People will say, okay, I don't, you know, I, I know what you're saying. It's not Italian. Let's say you speak Spanish and you're speaking to someone in Italy. They'll say, yeah, I understand what you're saying for the most part, but clearly they're not the same language. There are some, some, some real differences between them. And it's, it, it would be a gross uh, overstatement to say that they're, they're one and the same because they're not. Uh, but they're close enough that you can make your way around if you speak one and then you can fake it in the other. Yes, the same 22 letters are used in the Aramaic alphabet that are also used in the Hebrew alphabet. Now today they're using the Aramaic script to write Hebrew. There, there was a different script before that called Paleo-Hebrew uh, script and then that, that fell out and it was replaced by the Aramaic script. But the Aramaic language never replaced the Hebrew language for those in the land of Israel.